In the dark silence of the Atlantic, something extraordinary was stirring beneath the waves. In July 2020, a 40-foot steel cylinder that had been sunk underwater was hauled to the surface off Scotland's Orkney Islands after spending two years on the seabed. It had stayed underwater so long that it was coated in a thick green-brown layer of algae. But what if I told you this was a data center? And all of this was a good idea. Most people thought it was a publicity stunt, others thought it was doomed to fail. But when scientists opened it up two years later, the results shocked everyone and might have just changed the future of the internet forever. But first, what is a data center? In case you're confused, think of it as a warehouse of the internet. It stored all the information we need for the internet to run, but it costs billions to cool. The idea of an underwater data center began as one of those outlandish think big projects inside Microsoft. In 2014, at an internal innovation event known as Think Week, here two super smart engineers, Sean James and Todd Rawlings, proposed dunking cloud servers in the sea and powering them with ocean renewables. Now here's where it gets interesting. Special projects leader Norm Whitaker embraced this vision and soon enough, Project Natick was born. A senior researcher, Mike Shepard, recalled, People responded to our work as if we were going to the moon. In our eyes, we were just fulfilling our charter, taking on challenging problems and coming up with solutions. So this brings us to our earlier question, why do this? And why not just power this data center on land like it has always been done? Well, to answer this, there's one simple explanation. Regular data centers are at risk of corrosion due to contact with oxygen, humidity, and even temperature fluctuations. The holy trinity of tech hell, in a way. So their goal was to exploit the ocean's naturally cool, stable environment and abundant offshore energy to build greener, faster deploying data centers. Another factor was the demand for cloud computing was exploding. And guess what? Almost half the world lives near the coast. If you could place data centers underwater, you'd get faster internet and free natural cooling from the ocean itself. Makes sense, right? After all, we use water to cool down data centers anyway, so why not give them a much needed swim? Though it's not to say the data center was just submerged without any safety precautions. They made sure to completely seal it to fight out any ocean-dwelling curious critters and, well, water. Because water tends to corrode things, and it's not exactly a computer's best friend. Other than the sealed container, they ensured a low-humidity nitrogen environment to better protect the servers and increase reliability. Once you're down 20 to 30 meters into the water, you're out of the weather, Shepard says. You could have a hurricane raging above you, and an underwater data center will be none the wiser. By mid-2015, the team had built their very own proof of concept, a small submersible capsule loaded with these servers. Microsoft had simply decided that they needed to test an idea out and create a prototype, something no one had thought of, especially not me. Its recovery marked the climax of an experiment that was out of this world and would start to answer the odd question, could a data center live quietly on the ocean floor and quietly outperform its land-based siblings? In August 2015, they towed this great lab prototype out to the calm Pacific waters off of California and gently lowered it to 30 feet depth. The vessel contained around 12 racks of hardware filled with unreactive nitrogen to keep moisture and corrosion out. Interestingly, for the next 105 days, it ran in complete darkness, lights out, on the seabed. The results were encouraging. The capsule survived perfectly intact, proving the core concept feasible and sparking plans for a full-scale trial. Finally, Microsoft had gone ahead and declared that the underwater data center concept was feasible in the Pacific test. But that's not quite where this journey ends. In fact, this was just the beginning. With the first test a success, the team set their sights on a much larger experiment, mainly because the first findings weren't solid enough yet. They needed more proof, and this project did something that they never could have expected. Microsoft commissioned France's Naval Group, which was a 400-year-old submarine builder, to design a 40-foot pressure vessel for Project Natick. They got to work and delivered a… cylinder. Okay, that sounds less cool than it is, but this cylinder was roughly the size of a standard shipping container. Inside, there were 12 server racks, totaling around 864 Microsoft Cloud servers and 27.6 petabytes of disk storage. In the spring of 2018, this giant capsule was assembled and tested in France from where it got loaded onto a flatbed truck and driven, even over ferry crossings, to the Orkney Islands of Scotland. 
There, it was secured to a ballast-filled steel frame towed offshore on a large gantry barge and slowly lowered foot by foot, 117 feet through the frigid, choppy waters to rest on the seabed. Project leader Ben Cutler would later recall that moment. The most joyful moment of the day was when the data center finally slipped beneath the surface on its slow, carefully scripted journey. But here is the thing. They didn't randomly decide on Orkney Island. It was chosen because its grid runs entirely on wind, solar, and experimental tidal power. This was integral so that the capsule could be powered 100% by renewable energy at all times. In fact, currently, the islanders generate more electricity than they need, and a cable now provides about a quarter of a megawatt to the submerged data center. The Natick team hoped that this natural air conditioning would let the servers run more efficiently than any inland facility. As Christian Belady, Microsoft's cloud infrastructure chief, explained, Energy self-sufficient data centers could be placed anywhere reachable by fiber, even near coasts with unreliable power, eliminating costly backup generators. Now the time had come to sink it. Once this beast was lowered onto the seafloor in June 2018, the data center was connected via fiber to Microsoft's network. After this came the time to test, and that was done by simply leaving it almost entirely alone. But of course, to make sure that protocols were being met, an onshore control station monitored every signal through the cable. Over the next 24 months, the capsule ran continuously under the North Sea, surrounded by complete darkness and silence. Its environment was quite friendly, however. One atmosphere of dry nitrogen with steady 40 degree Fahrenheit seawater outside, perfect for deep sea conditions. The major benefit of this whole escapade was its remoteness. The team intentionally chose Orkney because its fierce waves, often 30 plus feet high, and strong currents would stress test the concept. As Shepard said, if a facility survives in those seas, we are good for just about any place we want to go. Back at the surface, Microsoft's engineers watched two years of logs come in, every server heat metric, every bit of performance data collected remotely. The capsule's cold, stable setting meant virtually no active cooling systems were needed. Seawater flowed in and out through heat exchangers to absorb server heat, and NASA-style insulation kept everything inside thermally constant. The reliability hypothesis was clear. With no humidity or oxygen and no humans tinkering inside, the servers should fail far less often than on land. Waiting two years for the final reveal didn't seem that hard, as time passed in a blink, and in summer 2020, the day came to raise the data center from its underwater slumber. After months of planning complicated by COVID-19 and Orkney's not-so-great weather, a ship arrived. Crews hoisted the encrusted cylinder out of the depths. As it broke the surface, the engines slowed. For a moment, the world's oceans held their breath. When it cleared the water, scientists noted that currents had kept it remarkably clean. Principal engineer Spencer Fowers marveled at the hull. We were pretty impressed with how clean it was, actually, he said. It did not have a lot of hardened marine growth on it. It was mostly sea scum. Sailors got to scrubbing and finally seemed to get the last of the algae off, eventually revealing a not-so-white case that had fought the sea for 24 months. It may not have been as new as when it took its first swim, but it still had minimal corrosion. But the real treasure lay inside of this capsule. 864 servers, each still standing strong and powered by the nitrogen-sealed atmosphere. As soon as it was out in the air, Technicians drew out their kits and took test samples of the air, which was still nearly pure nitrogen, and unplugged each of them rack by rack, sending drives and boards back to Microsoft and Redmond for analysis. Though it wasn't like all of the servers had stood the test of time, but only a handful had lost the underwater battle. Even the few parts that did fail would give great lessons. By examining them against the millions of cycles endured flawlessly, researchers hoped to translate the underwater advantage to any data center. Thankfully, the team had quickly found that their wildest hopes had been met, and their crazy idea was actually not that bad. But what were the stats? It's one thing to have a data center in one piece, and a completely different thing to have it working and actively crushing the numbers. The real question was simple. Is it a better alternative to land-based data centers? The result was pretty easily straightforward. The underwater servers had a failure rate only one-eighth that of equivalent ones on land. Put another way, they were eight times more reliable, which is something 
I'm still trying to wrap my head around. Ben Cutler, Project Natick's director, summarized the finding bluntly. Our failure rate in the water is one-eighth of what we see on land. We are considerably better than that, he said. The analysis pointed to very clear reasons. All those precautions they took were paying off. The dry nitrogen atmosphere kept corrosion and temperature swings at bay, and with no human hands bumping into things, hardware ran pretty smoothly. We left it filled with dry nitrogen, so the environment is pretty benign in there, noted Fowers. In this artificially perfect world, computers don't actually operate well in the same environment that humans inhabit, Cutler explained. The absence of oxygen and humidity slowed down corrosion and material degradation. Without those stressors, the electronics aged more slowly and off-gassing from plastics and cables never turned into harmful deposits the way it can in land-based data centers. Engineers found that Orkney's renewable-powered grid, though considered spotty by many inland operations, was sufficient to power the Natick underwater capsule. Microsoft reports that the facility draws just under one-quarter megawatt when at full load. Even with only moderate wind and tidal generation, the grid kept it running reliably, suggesting much less infrastructure may be needed for robust, renewable-powered data centers. These results delighted the team and reshaped Microsoft's vision of data center design. The Northern Isles operation confirmed that sealed underwater data centers are feasible as well as logistically, environmentally, and economically practical, to quote Cutler. The project has already influenced Microsoft's broader strategy for sustainability. Lessons on cooling, air purity, and energy sourcing are feeding back into land-based data center designs. As Cutler put it, Natick had done what it set out to do. We have done what we need to do. Natick is a key building block for the company to use if it is appropriate. The experiment has even sparked internal planning for edge and tactical deployments. Azure executives are now considering coastal and remote scenarios where ships or submarines could deliver on-demand cloud resources. William Chappelle, an Azure vice president, captured the excitement. We are populating the globe with edge devices large and small, he said, noting that making data centers reliable enough not to need human touch is a dream of ours. But the final question is, what does this mean for the future? Well, it's not as simple as I wanted it to be. In the end, Microsoft does not see Project Natick as a wholesale replacement for cloud servers, but as a complement. We don't see underwater data centers as replacing those on land, Cutler said, but view it as an additional offering to serve customers. So even if they aren't here to change everything, they eventually might, especially since the true success of Natick lies in the path it created. The fact that now rapidly deployable data centers that are explicitly powered by clean energy exist is enough to change the course eventually. Beyond the technical triumphs, one fascinating layer of Project Natick lies in its environmental studies. When Microsoft retrieved the Orkney capsule, marine biologists examined the hull and surrounding seabed to check for damage. Surprisingly, instead of finding a scar on the ecosystem, they noted how sea life had colonized the vessel, almost like an artificial reef. Barnacles, crabs, and fish treated the structure as shelter. Researchers concluded that if managed properly, underwater data centers might actually double as marine habitat enhancers rather than disruptors. That is a striking contrast to traditional land-based data centers, which often consume acres of real estate and compete with agriculture or housing. This ecological angle is part of why the project still draws attention today. Globally, data centers already consume nearly 2% of the world's electricity and produce a comparable slice of carbon emissions. Every improvement in efficiency matters. Natick's findings feed into a larger conversation about how to cool future computing infrastructure. For example, some companies have looked northward. Facebook built a massive facility in Luea, Sweden, to take advantage of Arctic air. Others experiment with geothermal cooling, placing servers near volcanic energy sources like Iceland. Microsoft's approach, however, skips chasing cold climates and instead uses the ocean's natural thermal stability, making the idea deployable almost anywhere with access to fiber cables. There's also a business dimension that can't be ignored. After Natick, analysts speculated whether underwater facilities might serve as edge computing pods. Picture a disaster-struck coastline where communications collapse. A prefabricated underwater capsule could be deployed offshore, restoring internet resilience within weeks. 
Similarly, militaries have shown interest, since sealed, unattended data centers could sit in strategic waters, immune to weather, and harder to physically sabotage. While Microsoft itself frames Natick as experimental, the lessons are rippling into conversations far beyond Redmond. Another overlooked benefit is security. Traditional server farms require human staff and face risks ranging from cyber intrusion to physical break-ins. By contrast, Natick's capsule was designed to be tamper-proof. Once sealed and sunk, only authorized recovery operations could access its contents. In an era where data breaches cost billions, that kind of physical isolation is appealing. Of course, the concept isn't without challenges. Maintenance remains the largest. If one server fails in a land data center, technicians can swap it in minutes. Underwater, everything must be engineered to last the full deployment cycle. That's partly why the Orkney experiment was so impressive. Over 800 servers ran with eight times better reliability, showing that fewer repairs might be needed in the first place. Still, scaling the idea from a single capsule to dozens worldwide will require clever solutions for swapping, upgrading, and recycling hardware safely. Speaking of recycling, Microsoft emphasized sustainability not just in energy use but in end-of-life handling. The Orkney vessel was designed to be fully recoverable and recyclable so no permanent junk would remain on the seafloor. Future capsules could be retrieved, refurbished, and redeployed like modular shipping containers. That portability is another subtle advantage. Rather than spending years and billions constructing a giant land facility, a fleet of smaller capsules could be manufactured, shipped, and sunk near demand hotspots within months. The symbolic impact of Natick may outlast the capsule itself. It demonstrated that radical, almost science fiction sounding ideas can yield practical, measurable results. Underwater data centers won't replace their terrestrial cousins anytime soon, but they've carved a new option into the global playbook. In the coming decades, as cloud demand continues to explode, we might see hybrid networks where some data flows through desert solar farms, some through Arctic halls, and some through silent steel cylinders resting on the ocean floor. In that sense, Natick wasn't just about servers, it was about imagination. It asked whether the future of computing could live where humans cannot, and then proved that the answer was yes. If orange peels could grow a forest and data centers can live underwater, what other impossible ideas might be hiding in plain sight? Do you think our future internet will be run from the bottom of the ocean? Let me know your thoughts in the comments, and as always, thanks for watching.